let's make a start. We have a number of fantastic speakers today as well as tomorrow. Um, but the first of all of them, and that I see also on the screen, or I could see on the screen earlier, yeah, there he is, uh, is Andrea Galassi. Uh, so uh, it's very nice to give welcome to, of course, a fellow Italian, uh, but also because Andrea's research is really, really relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, so Andrea has been working in the field of symbolic knowledge and, and knowledge representation for quite a long time now. Um, He's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Bologna. He's working uh, in the Language Technologies Lab uh, of Professor Paolo Torroni, who's been doing research in this field for, for a very long time. Um, so Andrea worked on his PhD uh, in Bologna, which he obtained uh, a year ago, um, worked on dissertation on the integration of deep neural networks and symbolic knowledge. Uh, but he has particular expertise and has been working on a number of projects which apply these technologies and apply NLP and symbolic knowledge representation techniques specifically to the legal domain. Uh, and so he's a great speaker to open our, uh, our week of events uh, because he's going to bring some real life expertise into representation of legal knowledge and its identification in legal documents and, and making available in formats that allow computers to make sense of it. Uh, and so without further ado, I'll pass on the baton to Andrea, who's going to give a presentation and talk uh, entitled Making Legal Documents More Accessible for Natural Language Processing, Analysis, Explanation and Multilingualism. So Andrea, over to you and thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Stefano. Can you hear me fine? We can hear you perfectly well. Perfect. Perfect. And thank you for the introduction. I will share my screen. Uh, which is this one, I think. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, all good. Perfect. Then let's start. So, uh, as Stefan has uh, already introduced me, uh, so I will just skip the few slides, the first initial slides. I will just say that, yeah, I'm postdoc researcher at the University of Bologna. I have a PhD in computer science and engineering, so I'm from the, let's say, technical side of, uh, of this hackathon, like the target of this hackathon. I've um, done my PhD on NLP applications using the um, deep networks and uh, neural symbolic knowledge. Um, and um, I work in the language technology lab that by Professor Paolo Pedroni. And we have a strong collaboration of basically all the legal projects we have with Professor Giovanni Santoni, which is a, a law professor. It's very, I think, a prestigious name in the law sector of the law academic sector, let's say. So uh, all the, 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 the things I will talk about are the results of the work of uh, uh, our team, that here you can see some other faces that work on this, and the team of uh, Professor Sartor and other uh, lawyers that have uh, worked with us. Um, so here are the, the Paolo is the leader of the lab, Marco Lippi is a professor at Modena and Reggio Emilia who has worked with us uh, uh, when he was in Bologna, and he still works with us uh, now that he's in Modena. Uh, Federico is uh, um, uh, recently graduated, uh, recently obtained his PhD, so he's uh, basically my, my colleague for most of staff, while Giulia, Eleonora, and Francesco are uh, the new people in the group, and they are starting to have uh, their fellowships uh, and the starting work, starting PhDs with us. And uh, so let's start with this. Uh, what is our purpose? This, uh, this, uh, this purpose is to make the legal documents more accessible. And as Ivan said, like this goes perfectly in the same direction that we said. Like uh, we don't want to automate anything. We want to. We don't want to have a computer or an artificial intelligence to make decisions instead of humans. But we want to make the process more uh, accessible, more understandable. Uh, by who? Uh, by a lot of people, like legal practitioners, we can uh, help their work, we can make their, their work easier, we can make them work uh, faster. Uh, we want uh, to, to be able to provide them the tools so, uh, that can improve the quality of their work. Uh, we want to help consumers associations to empower consumers to um, uh, allow them to uh, defend their rights in, a, in an easier way and to citizen to provide them uh, means to understand the laws, uh, uh, contracts, decisions, uh, whatever is a legal document, let's say. And uh, we need, need to take into mind that each of these um, users, each of these targets, let's say, 
has different competences and different needs. Uh, and so we must keep in mind uh, who is the final user of what are we developing. So um, we must ask, ask ourselves uh, what uh, the user will, uh, will be able, if the user will be able to do the task by themselves. For example, legal practitioners uh, will be able to do the same things we are doing with artificial intelligence and property. Our purpose is just to uh, make them make them uh, work uh, faster or easier, or uh, uh, we want only to facilitate their work. Uh, while, for example, for a, a citizen, we are maybe we are providing them a tool to do something they would not be able to do by themselves. And also, we must keep in mind the competences that uh, the user has. General, like uh, so they can, uh, uh, they know if they know the legal domain, maybe they can understand some things. If they don't know, they must explain everything. And uh, if our tools and limitations can they patch our limitation with their competencies or, uh, uh, or not? So, all these things are uh, what we need to keep in mind in general, the same when we are developing. Uh, tools and uh, instruments for, uh, for uh, using artificial intelligence in this way. So let's get uh, a bit of the topic. Uh, we will talk about these three dimensions, the analysis of the documents. And so analytical task, even a document, we want to uh, acquire some knowledge about the, the document. Uh, explanation, we want to be able to uh, explain why that decision or that uh, how we've been instructed what the decision was made and uh, stuff like that. And in the end, we will talk also about multilingualism. We will talk about it, uh, let's say, briefly, but uh, it, it will be, it's a, it's a super important aspect. So uh, we will discuss three case studies that come from three different projects. The first one is uh, outcome prediction of asylum requests. So we have uh, um, a document, a legal document that concerns the decision that the judge has done regarding an asylum request. And we will try to predict the outcome uh, based on features. And this is the context of the project library. And then we will try to extract the features from the documents from the fiscal aid decision. And finally, we will uh, uh, talk about uh, you know, the detection of unfairness in the context of legal contracts, such as demo service, services and privacy policies. So uh, let's start with the outcome prediction. What is the motivation of this work? Is that the often asylum application it's uh, are difficult to understand even for legal uh, practitioners. Like the decision that the judge takes about this case can be uh, can be subjective, can be difficult to understand, uh, if, unless someone is, uh, I mean, if, if, if it's a judge uh, themselves, if they are judged themselves. Because judge must uh, consider factual data uh, uh, that the, the applicants is bringing, but also consider all the information they are, they are, that are available uh, about the country of origin, and uh, also uh, and, uh, information about the experiences that uh, the person applying for asylum uh, has lived. But often this information is hard to find and even more hard to prove. Um, so uh, the context- Hi, Andrea. Is Andrea, yeah? really sorry, sorry to, to stop you. We, we hear your sound a little bit fluctuating. I don't know if there's anything you can do um, perhaps speaking closer I, to the mic. Yeah, well, I, I can do this. If this is good, excellent. Thank you. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries. So the the uh, sec. Okay. The this is uh, contextual to the project Lila, which is a project uh, um, for a, an Italian project. Uh, that is about legal analytics in Italian law. There's many objectives, as you can see, and we uh, focus on this, the forecasting of decisions. Um, it, it's a project that aims to uh, study the law, uh, the law making and the decision making pro, uh, process, and to use tools, uh, NLP and artificial intelligence tools, to understand it better. Uh, but is, it has no purpose. Uh, um, in di differently from uh, the other two projects we will talk later, the, there is no purpose of creating a final tool, let's say, while the other two projects really wants to obtain a final tool that can be used. This is more of an investigation uh, project. So 
we were talking about these asylum requests. So in international protection, we have uh, three degrees of uh, protection. Two are defined by the international law. A third one is defined in the Italian law. And there are two phases. One of it is administrative, which means that uh, uh, simply the uh, applicant brings all the documents and uh, the administration decides whether it should be accepted or not. And then there is an appeal step uh, where, where there is a judge that decides uh, uh, after uh, interviews with the applicant. So it's extremely difficult to find the written documentation for uh, appeal claims. And so the judges based, uh, must be based their decision on uh, um, the, the, the interviews that are done by these, uh, uh, these uh, applicants. And uh, they, they write, write all this in, a, in their final decision. So in the final decision, we can find all the information they've gathered by themselves that they were available and they obtained during the interviews. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only document that is publicly available or at least available to us while we were doing the study. Um, so we want to understand, the purpose of this, uh, this work is trying to understand the key features that uh, uh, drive the decision of judges. Uh, we want to, obviously there are uh, manuals about how judges should take this decision and uh, everything. We want to see if uh, analyzing the data, uh, these information are respected, if there are difference between uh, different uh, um, judges that um, do their work in different places and uh, understand also the, their, their reasoning process up to some degree, let's say, model, model this the decision project, process. So our data were 100 the judicial decision on asylum applications, uh, which honest are not very much, like uh, when we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, natural language processing, uh, usually we'll, we would like to have many more documents, but we have done what we could. <laughs> So um, each decision is annotated by a legal expert according to 62 features. And the, that are, uh, they basically find inside these decisions uh, elements that are particularly, that can be relevant for the final decision. They regarding, uh, there are, um, let's say, bureaucratic information about the appeal, information about the, the person, information about the country of origin and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, our, we want to learn to forecast this decision. Uh, so we want to understand the, the process that drives the decision. We want to learn to forecast it. If we learn to predict it, we are closer to understand how it works. Uh, but the problem is that this, this, these documents are hundreds or thousand lines long. Uh, so it's, they are way too big. And uh, so we need two steps. I mean, there are, there, there are people developing uh, uh, tools to analyze even longer documents, but uh, typically they're very costly in terms of resources. So uh, we use a two steps approach. First, we extract this in, the inf relevant information from the document. And then using this relevant information, we predict the outcome. So we have two questions. First of all, can we extract this information? And then once we have this information, can we predict using this information? And then we can explain the outcome using this information. And in this case study, we will focus on this second stage. We will focus on given the information, let's try to predict the outcome. Um, so I will be in, in this old talk, I will be very, uh, let's say methodological. I will, will not go deeper in, um, go deep in, uh, to which tools specifically we have used or anything. So I hope this could be of a better interest for the whole audience. Also because, I mean, if you want to go, I mean, you can ask it later about specific tools, um, but also is something that is easier to find online, just Googling it. While I think that the methodological approach is one, is the thing that is more important to, to share, let's say. So first of all, we do a correlation analysis. Our purpose is, since we have many features, uh, we would like to, and it's difficult to model a decision pro process considering all these features, we want to remove the ones that, we con that could be uh, redundant. So we run a, a statistical correlation test uh, between each pair of features and find that some of them are stru strongly correlated. And so probably we can remove uh, some of them uh, without losing information. For example, the specificity of the statement uh, 
of the applicant uh, is often cor uh, is a, a strong correlation with the internal consistency of the statement. Uh, the more they are consistent, the more they are uh, specific, apparently. So uh, how do we model the, the, the decision process? We apply, we try to predict the outcome using decision tree. Decision trees basically are what you can see on the left is uh, their algorithms that try to that treat each uh, feature as a variable and try to build a, a, a tree to make the decision. Uh, we start from the top. Uh, so we start from the 28.1, which is one of these features. We see the value of this feature and then we take a decision. If the value is one, we accept the, the decision. Otherwise we go on the left and then we go, we analyze another feature and so on and so forth. So every uh, round node is a decision rule and uh, we until we reach uh, a which means accept or it or r for reject and uh, this so looking at this tree we can kind of uh, learn and you can kind of model the the logical process of the court so to give you an, a concrete example uh, in this tree we are following this uh, this reasoning uh, model we f first check uh, if there are the grounds for expatriation, so persecution, serious harm and risk of vulnerable condition. If there are, okay, we accept the request. Otherwise, we check if uh, the person is integrated in the national territory. If uh, it is, uh, we accept it, otherwise we go on. We check if there is a generalized violence and uh, terrorist group inside the country of origin. If there isn't, uh, we reject. If there is, we go on and we evaluate the coherence of uh, the external coherence. If I don't remember wrong, uh, is how much the, the statement, the interview is coherent with the available information uh, about the, the country. Uh, so obviously the, this may be not the perfect process of the judge. Uh, you can see in red that uh, in the second step, there is a one, when, when, when it's written one FP, it means that is one false positive. So in our test, uh, one decision has been uh, misclassified using the criterion of integration national territory. So obviously the, these uh, methods, since we have uh, not many documents, our methods, are, our results are limited, but the, the method is, uh, it's good in most of cases and uh, provides a very clear, uh, model of the of the reasoning process so so far we have learned to predict uh, with some errors but uh, still uh, the outcome from specific features and we learn to model the logic of the decision process which is so these outcomes that we predict are completely explainable and um, we have seen analyzing the 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 decision tree we obtained our legal expert told us that decision models are coherent with the law so they're coherent with the, uh, what the judges are supposed to, to follow as a decision process. And we also seen that even if we use data from different uh, uh, courts, uh, we have obtained uh, similar trees. So each court, all the courts seems to follow a similar decision process, which is, uh, I mean, it's what we hope to, to obtain that uh, every, uh, all that different courts uh, follow, the, follow the law and they act similarly. Um, and yeah, also we have discovered that some aspects are uh, implied by other aspects. But uh, what is missing? We, we are missing the extraction of these features. Like uh, in this document, we had uh, legal experts that are not that uh, read these 100 uh, uh, documents and uh, extracted this information, but we want to do it automatically. So can we do it automatically with the natural language processing? So next case study, we try to do this. We try to extract features from a fiscal aid decision automatically. So uh, once again, the, the, uh, object, the final objective is still to predict the outcome of the judicial decision. Uh, and uh, we, want to ex uh, we want to explain the reason of this judicial decision. Uh, in this case, we don't rely on features, but we want to analyze uh, the uh, chain of reasoning uh, the chain of arguments uh, used inside the decision. So with uh, this context of this uh, case studies, Project Adele, uh, who's, which uh, has the purpose of developing a tool, like a, uh, a real tool that could be used by legal experts uh, to uh, do many tasks. One is argument mining, outcome prediction, but also compare different arguments from different uh, documents and see which are similar, like retrieve similar arguments in different decision 
and so on and so forth. So we are back in the pipeline. We have addressed the second step in the previous case study. In this case study, we start from uh, uh, trying to extract the information from the documents. So uh, the, uh, we use argument, we apply argument mining, which is a discipline that uh, as the purpose of this discipline is to extract uh, uh, natural language arguments and the relationship from documents, from textual documents. So we want to extract the argumentative reasoning that is happening inside the decision. And uh, these, uh, uh, being able to perform argument mining of these documents may help many other tasks, uh, obviously outcome prediction, but also the classification of legal documents, the summarization, and uh, of also the retrieval of arguments from large corpora. Uh, we don't we may not want uh, to consult uh, every document entirely. We may want to consult only the reasoning that's happening in those documents. So uh, our data set is made by 40 decision of the um, Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, we focus on only a specific part, which is the finding of the courts that contains uh, the argumentative reason of the court. And uh, legal experts annotated these documents on three levels. So we find the elements we consider argumentative. So premises, conclusions, and uh, uh, obviously we the, the rest of it. And that we uh, classify the premises as factual. So something that uh, report a fact, a situation, an event, or a legal uh, premise, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, rules, uh, precedents, uh, interpretations of the laws. Uh, also, yeah, I didn't see it, but uh, premises are basically all the intermediate steps in the uh, reasoning process, in the argumentative inference, while conclusion is only the very last step of the process. Fine, and uh, finally, we annotate also the argumentation scheme of the legal premises. So, uh, for example, if a premise uh, is based on uh, rules or on precedents, uh, or it's uh, about interpretation of the law, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have uh, like the legal expert that annotated these documents were uh, had um, a strong agreement uh, about what he what was a premise conclusion factual and legal uh, regarding schemes uh, uh, there was less agreement it apparently is more difficult to determine uh, uh, which is the model that is followed in the inside the the the, the premise uh, also keep in mind this i think that they haven't sent in the beginning but it's fundamental uh, in all this Mm, techniques we are using. We are using supervised learning, which means that the, the, the computers learn something trying to imitate humans. So we provide them data and they learn from the data we have provided. So it's almost impossible. I mean, it could happen, but it, uh, it's very rare that a machine like, can uh, perform better than humans. So if, uh, the, if humans cannot agree on which is uh, what schema, it's very difficult for a machine to learn it because there, there wasn't an, uh, an agreement between humans. So the data they receive is not, uh, uh, is not precise. And so they will not be able to learn uh, precise things. So this is an example of a document. Uh, you can see on the column on the left, uh, two different uh, legal premises. The first one is from precedent. The second one is uh, both from precedent, you can see PREC in the, the, in the tag, and uh, from uh, uh, class, I think it was classification. On the right instead, you can see factual premises. So a statement that rec uh, reports something that has actually happened, like uh, uh, these uh, 2000 and what was written in these 2004 letters and uh, um, what the general court, uh, uh, the, yeah, what the the behavior of the general court after this letter? So, very factual statements, and in the in the bottom of the slide you can see the conclusion. The conclusion ID is C twelve, so it means that there were eleven premises chained between them, and in the end there was this conclusion. Okay, this was just to give you an idea of how these documents actually look like. I mean, our a part of a document looked like. So uh, what do we do? Uh, we take uh, these sentences we in, to process them and to classify them. We uh, must encode them in a representation that is must be processed by uh, classifiers. So we take every sentence is modeled as a numerical vector in a multidimensional space. 
So each, uh, I don't know, each sentence is transformed in a, a vector of, I don't know, 100, 200, 600 uh, dimensions. In, in each dimension, there is a number. Uh, we experiment with three different uh, uh, methods. The first one is the most uh, traditional one, which is a, a TF-IDF. Basically, it's a statistical method based on lexicon. Uh, so we represent each sentence based on uh, the frequency of the word inside the sentence compared to the, um, the frequency of the word inside the, the other sentences. Here I've written document, but by document, I mean sentences. And then we use the sentence birth and legal birth. Uh, they are uh, language models. Language models basically are neural networks. So uh, very complex algorithmic uh, fun function that takes in uh, as input uh, a sentence and output one of these uh, uh, numerical vectors. Uh, basically, how, how, do, how do they do that? Each language model is different, but basically they've been uh, trained. They've been uh, uh, yeah, trained on very, very large corpora. We're talking about mil billions, millions or billions of documents to learn human language and to represent it in a numerical uh, form. Uh, the important thing about these methods is that they are based on semantics. What does it mean? It means that uh, sentences that are, have a similar uh, meaning but have a different lexical representation will be mapped into similar into nearby uh, portion of the space. So we have used some standard uh, classifiers from uh, machine learning libraries, nothing particularly cool. And we have seen that uh, classifying uh, premises and conclusion is not difficult. Same goes from legal and factual. We obtain very high scores, like uh, we're able to classify more than 90% of uh, the sentences correctly. The schema depends, like the schema on which the annotators were uh, having uh, had the good agreement were easy. The other ones were very difficult. So to wrap it up, we can we have seen that we can extract and classify argumentative sentence from document. And we have seen also that lexical representation, the TFIDF, is often informative enough. Uh, these doc in these documents, uh, the lexicon used uh, uh, in, in the sentence is very informative. We don't need to analyze the semantic in a particularly complex way. The, the lexicon can be enough. Um, and yeah, also we need to improve the agreement and the definition of the schemas because uh, otherwise, if, we, if our human annotator don't agree, uh, the computer will not agree with anything. And as future work, we want to learn to predict the links. So, so we've learned to find the arguments, and, but uh, to properly explain a document, we also must uh, find the links uh, between the arguments and find, and so to recreate the reasoning process. Okay, last case study, uh, unfairness detection in contracts. So uh, the motivation is that uh, providers of online service still <laughs> use unfair uh, clauses, despite the, like all, all the regulations that are in place. And uh, despite the uh, enforcer's competence, because, and so our purpose is to empower consumers by providing them a tool to analyze contracts, uh, empower association of consumers that can use this tool, but also but, uh, hopefully empower enforcers that can use this tool to uh, analyze the, the contracts. And uh, I mean, we don't want them to uh, blindly uh, agree with our tool, but to just help them to have a, pers a quick perspective about the documents. So the context of this is Project Claudette. Uh, that is, uh, the, the purpose of this project is automatically find the, 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 the unfair clauses in contracts. On, uh, we specifically address terms of services and uh, um, privacy policies. And uh, yeah, this is the link uh, to the project. So the objective is to recognize the unfair clauses. Uh, we want also to be able to explain why this, those uh, clauses are unfair. We want to differentiate uh, between uh, types uh, and degrees of unfairness, but also try to give a motivation that could be helpful for the, uh, for the citizen to, to understand why is that unfair. And also we want to handle multilingualism since we have uh, like uh, if each company has uh, their contracts in different languages. We don't want to, uh, we want to uh, exploit the knowledge we have obtained on one language on the other languages. 
So uh, we have uh, we start with uh, a data set of uh, terms of service and privacy policies in English, and we annotate uh, uh, the type of unfairness and the degree of unfairness. So if it's uh, absolutely unfair or uh, moderately unfair or probably possibly unfair. So yeah, this is like uh, the a set. Uh, the, the, these are the categories of unfairness we we find. So for example, uh, the unilateral termination of contracts, for example. Um, I think these are the terms of service categories of unfairness. Um, so we want to distinguish the uh, we, we were talking about explanation. We want to distinguish the types and degrees of unfairness. This we can do it uh, since there are not so many different types of unfairness and degrees. We can simply uh, use them uh, as categories. And uh, when we classify as unfair or unfair, we also predict uh, what is the type and the degree of unfairness. It's more difficult to motivate the reason of unfairness because there are so many possible reasons of unfairness. And uh, also we think that knowing the reason of unfairness can help to recognize unfairness. So we think it could be helpful to learn them together. Our solution was to use uh, uh, memory augmented neural networks, which are basically, and this is like the more technical moment I see, I think. This is the look of a memory network. So we have a memory uh, where we store all the possible explanation written in natural language. So we have some lawyer, some law expert that has written all the possible explanation of why a term of service, a sentence in a term of service can be unfair. And uh, also we've, uh, they have annotated like in these documents, the reasons, and we train our model to retrieve these uh, reasons and then classify. So basically what happens, uh, uh, it's, everything starts with the query, which is the sentence we want to classify. Then we go upside towards the number one. Here we compare the query to the uh, what to the all the possible motivation of unfairness we have in the memory. Through an, an algorithm, we learn to compare them, and uh, we extract. Uh, we we make a, let's say a, uh, we create a, a joint representation of the two, and uh, we. Uh, update our query. So we insert this uh, information about unfairness into the representation of the query. And then what we do, we do it again until uh, we are satisfied. We keep doing this over and over until we gather all the reasons of unfairness and we create a, a, a complex representation that has the original sentence and all the possible uh, reason of unfairness we've detected. And only finally, we classify it as a fair or unfair. Uh, so this is how it looks like, uh, like from the outside. So we input uh, uh, a terms of service, and uh, the the tool tells us uh, Claudette found one potentially unfair clause, and uh, shows us the potentially unfair clause. So by accepting the terms of service, you agree to be bound by this arbitration clause and class action waiver. It tells us why, uh, for uh, because uh, arbitration and contract by using, and then shows us the reasons. Uh, for why this is unfair and also gives us the score of confidence. So it's probably unfair because first reason, and then it can be unfair for second reason and the third reason. Uh, one thing, Claudette is a working tool, is uh, out there, you can play with it. I mean, it's not something, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, it's still like a proof of concept, it's still a demo is not a, a perfect tool, but it's something that you, you can already use and you can already see if it, uh, if it works or not to you. Um, while the other tools of, uh, in the other case study I've talked about, there are still research project going on and we still don't have uh, something to show. We hope to have something in uh, a year or so. Uh, finally, in these uh, few minutes that are left, let's talk about multilingualism. So, uh, we want to extend our work from English contracts to uh, contracts on other languages. Specifically, we worked on Polish, German, and Italian. Uh, so what we could do? Well, we do the same, right? We take uh, contracts, uh, 100 contracts in, uh, in Polish language, and we train a new model on that. But this would require to hire lawyers or legal experts that annotate 100 contracts in Polish. And while it's easier to annotate, uh, like to find the 
a legal expert that annotates stuff in English, it's more difficult to find them uh, experts to annotate stuff in Polish or Italian or German. And so it will be very, very expensive to do all this from scratch. Okay, uh, we want to, we have already acquired some knowledge in English. We want to exploit that. So another possibility will be like, okay, we train this model to work in English. Well, let's just translate everything in English, right? We take the contract, we translate it in English and we see what happens. But this way we are very dependent on the quality of the translation. The translation may alter the content of the document. There may be you know, some uh, shades of how things are written that may be altered by the translation. And so the input will be very noisy. And noisy means like uh, uh, in imperfect, very, yeah. So we have a different idea. First of all, let's look at these contracts. In the European Union, the terms of service privacy policies are very similar, even in different languages. Uh, if we look at the privacy policy of Netflix in German or in Italian, it will be mostly the same in terms of content and also in terms of structure. Things are, be, will be written more or less in the same order. There will be some discrepancies because for example, uh, a sentence that, uh, a single sentence in Italian may be translated in two or three sentences in German or the other way around. So there may be structural differences in, uh, the, in terms of how sentences are, uh, are, are presented. So we, def we say that these um, they, the documents are parallel because same uh, content and similar structure, but they are asymmetric because they have these discrepancies. So uh, a clear example is this one. So for example, this is an example where uh, a single information is split in two sentences. So we have uh, 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 the, on the left, you have the English, so we have uh, a single sentence in English that is unfair for two reasons. And while in the Italian contract on the right, uh, the same sentence is split in two different uh, sentences and each of them is, is uh, unfair for one of those reasons. So the unfairness is distributed in these sentences. While, uh, yeah, this is from TripAdvisor. Uh, this is another example where we have uh, one sentence in English, one sentence in English. On the uh, on the left we have on the right we have two sentences uh, corresponding to this uh, in Polish, but in this case the unfairness is not in both sentences. Only the second sentence is unfair. So our idea. So this was to focus on the discrepancies that are important. We 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 need to know these discrepancies to know the limit of our tool. Our idea is projection. So we we want to automatically transfer information from the English and the English document to the uh, document in the other language. So we don't need the legal expert to annotate the same contract in different language. We, uh, we need them to annotate it in one language and then we transfer the annotation from one language to the other. We will have problems with the discrepancies, but uh, besides that, uh, we like in terms of uh, transport, transportation of this information, should be, if, if we are good at uh, match the sentence, the corresponding sentences, it should work. So we remove the cost of human annotators because they need to annotate only one language. The point is due to the discrepancies, our data will not be perfect. So we will have some errors here and there in data. But we hope that these discrepancies are few enough that the error in the data uh, will be not uh, will not have a, an impact in the final result. While if uh, you, if we use the translation uh, of the input, uh, we will have an impact every time. So this is how it looks like. Uh, we have a document in uh, English language. This is the one on the top uh, left. We have a document in uh, German on the top right. We translate the document in German in a document in English, which is the one in uh, um, the bottom. And then we compare the similarity of, uh, we, we, we compare the sentences and measure the similarity or the dissimilarity between sentences. We match uh, sentences in the English document to the sentence in the document translated from German to English. And then since the translation is one-to-one, -one, we can report the label back into the German document. 
So the uh, labels are in the English document, they go into the, the translated uh, uh, German document, and they go back in the original German document, okay? This is like the, the process they follow. And yes, this is, uh, I've seen, I said everything. Uh, there is a, but we have a problem, the translation, right? Uh, the translation may not be perfect. That, I mean, we have two problems, the discrepancies and the translation. The discrepancies up to a certain degree, we can handle it uh, with the algorithm of uh, uh, projection. The translation could be a problem. So how can we do this? We uh, can try to use a multilingual embedding. So we have talked about uh, language models that are uh, usually that model one language. Recently, we have there was a boom of multilingual uh, language models. Uh, so that try to map uh, sentences even in different languages uh, in the same vector space. So if I write something in Italian and in German, they will take these uh, sentences and map them in the nearby vectors. Uh, a sentence in Italian that means uh, something. I don't know. Uh, I like uh, tea. And the sentence in German that means the same will be closer than a sentence than two sentences in Italian that have a different meaning. Okay, so this is really a, a good, a great step forward. Uh, we can use this in two ways. We can use this, for example, to skip the translation step during projection. Okay, so we avoid to um, to translate and we simply project, uh, computing the similarity between documents written in different languages, or we can skip projection uh, at all, we can, using the English uh, uh, documents, train a model that, uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, we, use it, we can start from the English uh, documents, uh, embed them, uh, encode them using these multilingual language models and train a model, uh, train a classifier to use this information. And then, uh, since it will be trained to recognize features that are independent from language because they are assigned by these language models, uh, we can completely skip uh, the uh, projection. So the final uh, result of the, our uh, projection uh, investigation uh, is that the discrepancy can affect the, the, the task, obviously, um, especially <coughs> the, we, the, we have the risk to uh, include the too many sentences but uh, we have also we have also seen that translation errors uh, don't impact very much. The similar the uh, similarity algorithm are strong enough to don't to not be impacted by the um, errors in the translation. And uh, yeah, overall the projection worked very well. But we will we are moving we are moving in the direction of uh, trying to skip it already, or at least integrate it with the multilingual models. And uh, yeah. That was it. Uh, I will wrap it up uh, in a, this final minute. So we have seen that uh, NLP, in the first case study, we didn't see any NLP, but uh, in general, we have seen that expert can define uh, specific features in legal documents. And uh, um, we have seen that uh, the models can be only as good as humans. So if the humans cannot define something, the computers will not be able to do it. We have seen how the, that we can use these features in the found by human experts to perform tasks and also to provide the explanation to this task. Uh, we can train machine learning models, NLP models to extract these uh, uh, features. And uh, we, can, uh, we can use, uh, in some cases, memory networks uh, to retrieve explanations written by humans that can help the task. We have seen also talk about uh, multilingualism through projection if the documents are parallel, because projection yeah, we have seen that is uh, uh, very useful and good, works very well in the parallel documents. In documents that are not parallel is more tricky. And uh, if the documents are not parallel, for example, we can go with multilingual embedding using multilingual language models. And uh, yeah, there are still open challenges. Uh, for example, multilingualism, even if we afford it, we tackle it with uh, multilingual language models, is still challenging. Is another open challenge is the transfer of knowledge about uh, across different legislation. Like if a, if we if a document is in English, uh, and we annotated it from unfairness, it could be unfair for the UK legislation, but it could be fair for the US legislation. 
So our direction, we still haven't investigated, and it's really interesting, uh, is the, the direction of uh, the, the investigation of different legislation. Can we learn, uh, to tr can we train some model, some natural language model to recognize uh, uh, the, the unfairness and also tells us uh, in which legislation is this uh, unfair? Or uh, what is uh, like the outcome prediction? If we are in Italy, this is the outcome. If we are in Germany, this is the outcome will be different. So this is an interesting direction of research, and uh, also there is a trade-off before between preserving to contextual information and reducing the input size. Uh, the model we use require limited input, and uh, uh, the more the bigger is the input, the more they will be slow, and the more they will require resource. At the same time, the more information we keep in the context, uh, the more the the more information is available to the model to learn. When humans, uh, uh, when they analyze uh, documents, have all the contextual information of the documents. So there is a trade-off between these two things. Finally, a page of references. You can screenshot this and uh, go to read uh, all of our publications. As you can see, they are projects that span many years. Uh, uh, Claudette started in uh, 2018, or maybe a little before, I think. Uh, while for uh, Lila and uh, Adele, we have started. We have, uh, st we we are st starting trying to publishing uh, now. Like we have uh, the last, we we are currently uh, submitting uh, uh, our uh, results to conferences and journals. So, uh, but here there is a lot of. But the the the, the topic in general has been discussed in these publications. And yeah, that was it. Sorry if I it took me a few minutes more. Uh, thank you for your time. No, thank you very much, Andrea. You are perfectly on time and really, really interesting projects I've been working on. Uh, so, grazie mille per la tua presentazione. Um, I think we can open the floor to, to questions and I, I, I will kick start the questions. Um, actually, with a question that, that, that I want to add another one. But the, the key question I have for you is whether you see any, uh, particular application of, of this line of work to legislation um, as a starting um, document. But the, the, the sort of follow-up question that I had from, from one of your last slides um, was also um, in terms of what was the role of legislation in your work so far? Um, because I think you've started from annotating basically court decisions, but of course, uh, if you were to go one step backwards, uh, you would find the legislation as well. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you see applications of this technology and research to legislation, but also what was the role of legislation in your project so far? Okay, so first of all, I'm not a legal expert, so I'm not the one that uh, studies legislation. I do. I know very little about all this, and there are many lawyers and legal experts that work with us and do all this uh, uh, ground and legal work for us. So I'm like in a, in the final uh, spot of the process, and I am in, in a, a privileged position to not have to, having to study all this. The, the disclaimer was as good as that of any lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that said, uh, okay, so the role of legislation, for example, in the annotation uh, was, for example, to decide, um, was necessary for the um, distinction of schema, for example. Lawyers had to know very well the legislation uh, about, uh, for, for example, the legal uh, the state aids, to know which, in the decision of the court which parts uh, were um, referring to a specific legislation or where instead like for example interpretation of the law like uh, because it's not super clear in the as they're written in the findings if i remember well when is uh, let's say an interpretation of a law or when is a uh, let's say a word by word uh, in, uh, application of the law so the, yeah the, the lawyers that have annotated these documents needed to have a, a deep knowledge of this to make this distinction Unfortunately, as I said before, some of the schema are, are still are still blurry. Like the distinction between the schema is still blurry, uh, because it's a difficult task to to recognize this. And uh, instead, in the legal contracts, in for, for everything that concerns Claudette, uh, yeah, the, the legal annotators had to uh, to to know all the, the, the legislation, to know the GDPR. Uh, like uh, as, uh, at the back of their hands uh, to be able to distinguish all the the, the shades of unfairness that can be found in uh, in uh, in the, in the contracts. Um, 
for what concern the application of these techniques uh, to uh, legislation i i I mean, I, I think that, for example, an interesting approach could be to analyze uh, the, the decision-making process. So once we, we, we do outcome prediction, we, have the, we know that we model the decision process as uh, in, in terms of features or in terms of argumentative reasoning and looking at what is happening, uh, you know, like what judges are doing and what uh, is the reasoning process. And uh, we can check, uh, let's say, if the our if the legislation is strong, if there is, a, for example, if there is if uh, is too too vague, if there is the necess necessity to be more specific about some uh, terms, if uh, for example, if we find out that uh, um, in the decision like that different judges or different courts uh, uh, make uh, different reason uh, follow a different reasoning process on uh, some topics or some specific instances. Uh, uh, then we can, uh, or like if we find, like once we have trained the model, we can uh, play with uh, uh, examples of, uh, uh, we can write, we can write our own uh, reasoning and see what happens. And uh, we can see if what the model has learned. And so if we find uh, out there are some, let's say, blind spot in the legislation or things that are, uh, yeah, or also we can maybe uh detect easier if judges finally like judges think that there are conflicts in the legislation uh maybe uh we can easily find the, uh, these conflicts that are being highlighted by judges and i mean if we analyze only the work of one judge or one court it's uh, it's a partial result but if we if these tools uh, once we apply these tools to decision uh, from i don't know uh, 100 judges and we can uh, you know redetect uh, these uh, these conflicts uh, they if they, they found the same conflict we have suggestions about how to uh, uh, change legislation i would say but also we can use these uh, these tools in principle to analyze current legislation and for example you can, we can apply argument mining i mean i'm not sure if it works but uh, possible direction could be to apply argument mining on legislation so extract the reasoning inside this legislation and see if there are uh, conflicts between the reasoning in the same legislation like I didn't, or or like I don't know um I I am not an expert on the UK uh, legislation but I guess there are probably like uh, uh, laws at different uh, steps so maybe we you, you can find if uh, there is a reasoning process in a, a, a certain level of law that conf it's in conflict uh, that attack is attacked by a, a reasoning uh, 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 reasoning inferences in other legislation you may not be an expert on legislation but i think you've given a lot of very very interesting ideas and um, also to anyone that will tackle the the challenges that we have for for the hackathon and um, because I'm, uh, you know, one of those challenges, for example, is around um, almost understanding to, to what extent we can improve the law um, by studying um, its effects and its application, for example, in court. Um, and I guess there are other aspects where this work could be taken forward in the future. I mean, once you have a, a map between basically a map of the legislation and decisions, you could possibly also model how changes in the legislation can affect future decisions and similar things as well. Uh, so uh, all work that I think is very interesting for, you know, what Dylan was saying before in terms of um, making it easier and more efficient for legislative drafters at the beginning of this sort of process to kind of model the law and make it more accessible, but also predict how it can be applied in all the sorts of things. So, um, An additional thing I was thinking just right now, like if you can, if uh, just to, to exploit memory networks, you could put uh, actually pieces of legislation into the network. And so you can uh, uh, extract the decision, like the, the pieces of legislation that uh, the, uh, the algorithm, the decision algorithm team is uh, using. And you could experiment like uh, if I change this part in the memory, if I change how this, uh, this uh, law is written, will the model be still able to uh, to pick up uh, that that the reasoning like and it, it could be something you want or something you don't want like uh, if uh, if you want if you want to change a legislation but without altering uh, uh, some part of it you can uh, I mean it's obviously you the humans uh, are the human expert would be the real one the, the people that really can tell you but just to to have a, a brief and immediate uh, uh, 
uh, result, you can try to do it and see if, uh, uh, okay, if I change this legislation, the, the, the model is still able to predict the same things or not. And it, do, I, do I want it to predict the same things or I don't want it? I mean, it depends on the purpose. Fantastic, thank you very much. Any, any more questions for Andrea? Sorry, I pronounced your name almost in an English way. Any <laughs> ah, questions fine. for Andrea? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a question. So um, thank you very much for the talk, by the way. It was really interesting. Um, my question, I guess, is about the, the future of these kinds of tools and I guess how we cope with uh, language inequality, because, you know, you mentioned that some languages don't have the wealth of coded data that, for example, English has. And uh, you talked about generalizing results across languages, but, you know, the tools designed for the primary language um, and they're more effective on the primary language. How do we kind of prevent incentivizing the loss of local languages uh, in legal documents and, and so in a way, I guess, prevent documents from becoming, you know, inaccessible to those who don't speak that you know, primary language that the tools are designed for. Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm not sure because I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't work on the developing of these uh, models. Uh, so I will uh, just mm, say what it comes to the top of my head. Uh, I, I think that the point would be to create uh, strong and difficult benchmarks for these models so that uh, when you try to when you decide whether you want to use a, a, a model a multilingual model you should first ter, uh, try and test it on a difficult benchmark design, uh, designed specifically for that language that contains uh, for example elements that are unique for that language and are in that uh, distinguish that language from uh, uh, other ones uh, so you can try it uh, and if you, if you see that uh, the language the language model is uh, not capable of understanding the specificity of this uh, of this language then uh, it's, it's not the right language model to use and uh, yeah i mean I, I think that the develop it's unfortunately obviously is a very difficult and costly process to create uh, good benchmarks because it requires a lot of people to uh, manually uh, decide and uh, create a lot of examples and stuff but I think that's uh, like uh, I, I think I mean in general they're considered like among the best resources like uh, in research in general uh, benchmarks are always something that people like to see because uh, uh, it, it, it helps also to discover for example biases or other stuff so yeah I think that should uh, I mean, if you are in the process of deciding whether you want to use a model or not, this is the direction. If you are, I mean, for scientists instead of that wants to uh, develop new language models and, or, or for example, integrate uh, uh, new languages in existing models, I think uh, this is what they should uh, do. They, they should uh, create uh, uh, spe uh, language specific uh, uh, data that are that in the tra and train and uh, see whether these uh, models can perform very well and train these models to uh, uh, perform on these uh, uh, difficult benchmarks. I think. Thank I hope you. I answered somehow to your question. Yeah, you did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, sorry, I've been uh, dipping in and out. Hi, um, Andreas, that was a brilliant presentation. Thanks so much. I learned so much. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, sort of how you work. Is it, is it an interdisciplinary team you work with to sort of build out something like Cla Claudette and, and how long that kind of takes? Because it sounds like a really big project. Um, and how in the hackathon, how we can just, you know, obviously thinking of doing something quite discreet um, and how we sort of manage that. Okay, so I arrived in the, I jumped in in this project when, the, when uh, it was already started. So other people have done the difficulty of putting the team uh, with, uh, before me, my arrival. So uh, our teams right now, are, uh, there is my team that is a language technologies lab. Uh, we do the machine learning, we do the, uh, the natural language processing and so on. And there is the, let's say, lawyer team, uh, legal expert team of Professor Sartor. And they are the ones that do annotations. So they are the ones that to do uh, that, um, yeah, do annotation and analyze uh, the results. Uh, so 
uh, I, I really don't know how they start, like this group uh, cre was created. Uh, and also there are other teams of uh, experts uh, across Europe, for example, for Claudette, there are people in uh, Poland and uh, yeah, it's a pretty big project. Uh, so like, for example, in the projects you're working now, uh, so yeah, it's a multidisciplinary, like the, the final effort is a multidisciplinary team, uh, but uh, there are like sub subunits, let's say. So typically what happens is like we discuss the problem together. Like for example, we want to do outcome prediction on uh, um, fiscal state aid. And so the uh, the lawyers comes to us. So uh, lawyer, are you using lawyers? But some of them are not lawyers. Sorry for this. Uh, uh, anyway, the legal expert comes to us and uh, they tell us like, okay, we would like to do this uh, this problem, and uh, we do like a brainstorming of uh, all the the problems. For example, we uh, the typical like one of the things we ask all the time is like, okay, are there are there structured documents or not, and uh, um, what are what is the um, type of language that is uh, inside this decision is uh, a type of language that is specific of the legal domain or is more general. How many authors are for these documents? Uh, is a single person writing it or are many actors in that? Because uh, uh, it, in terms of uh, in natural language tools, uh, there are some that are better for monological analysis. So and there are better for dialogical analysis. So with, there is a moment uh, like where we discuss together, uh, we, we ask about the data and they ask about what we think could be possible to do. Uh, then there is, a, uh, then we try to, uh, let's say to define uh, the, the task together. So what will be the input more or less and what will be the output? Um, then uh, it uh, they, like kind of we we go along our separate ways. They provide us some data, and we try to think about uh, which models and which things that we want to try. They go with the tagging and everything. And from time to time, we discuss with each other. For example, if they're having difficulties with the tagging, uh, uh, for example, I don't know. Uh, one big problem with tagging is the boundaries. Like, uh, should I consider an entire sentence? Uh, uh, a clause, so a unit of uh, speech, or uh, I don't know, a paragraph. And uh, so we discuss with each other these aspects. And, and at the same time, we discuss with them, like, uh, is it important to have, a, for example, in the schema, is it important to differentiate this and this? Uh, is it possible that something has more than one schema? And uh, so we discuss the, uh, or like, uh, uh, how many, inf uh, which information do you think we can combine together? Is this useful? Do you think uh, it would be useful or not? And uh, then they produce the data. We produce uh, the models. Then we try to apply our models to their data. And uh, then together we look at the results and uh, we can say like, we highlight what was working and what's not and the possible reason of uh, uh, what, what was that, what has happened. And while they, they look at the results and tell us like, uh, okay, this is, uh, it, there is a logical reason. There is, uh, it's, it's plausible that is happening or this doesn't make any sense. And like, uh, for example, this is a weird, ex a weird result. You should look more into it. And we try to analyze uh, uh, more specifically the behavior, for example, of the model in some specific sample to see why there was an error, for example. So yeah, sorry, I, I had given a very long answer. I hope it was uh, satisfactory. Yeah, 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 no, it's really interesting. Thanks very much. But yeah, I, I, just to wrap it up, it's really important that uh, the, let's say IT experts uh, have a basic knowledge of the data they're working on and what is the idea of the task and the base and the low and the low people must have a basic knowledge of what's happening in terms of representation and in terms of uh, uh, what features and stuff like that uh, because otherwise uh, everyone will give their own interpretation without understanding what's really going on so it's really important that uh, they 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 must talk to each other and must <laughs> communicate to the better of the, the possibility Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, unless we have any other questions, we'll set you free. Uh, we have a <laughs> lunch you. break until one, but let me say a very, very big thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your projects with us. Uh, it's all very, very interesting. And hopefully we'll get you to apply some of this to legislation as well. We'll steal you from the world of the court decisions to bring you over to thank the world of legislation. 
Thank you. I've put in the presentation the the, the links to the projects. Uh, if you want, I can send it to you the PDF. So you I mean if you want to look around what we are doing and play with some of our tools, you are welcome to do it. That would be great. If you send us the material, we'll we'll make it available to everyone. Yeah. Thank perfect. you so much again, and everyone else. We're going to see you in about forty minutes, so we'll resume at one, um, and then we have three talks this afternoon as well. At in meanwhile, thank you again, Andrea, and see everyone in in about forty minutes. Bye. Thank you. Bye.